Bueno, buenos días a todos. Y sí, es verdad que me oigo mucho. Desde ahí se me oye bien, supongo. Muy bien. Bueno, buenos días a todos. Muchísimas gracias. Hola, Chema. Muchísimas gracias a Day One por dejarnos este espacio un año más. Para nosotros es un placer volver a estar aquí hablando de biotecnología. Y durante, la siguiente, durante los siguientes minutos vamos a hablar un poquito de biotecnología en general y en concreto. Yo, mi intención ahora es daros unos, uh, unas pinceladas de cuál es la situación, cuál es el momento que pasa la biotecnología ahora mismo. Y mi intención es convenceros de que la biotecnología le está pasando más o menos lo mismo que le pasó al digital hace 30 o 40 años. Eh, si salís con alguna idea más o menos en esta dirección, quiere decir que he hecho bien mi trabajo. Y después vais a poder ver el caso concreto de tres empresas que están desarrollando aplicaciones nuevas en el campo de la biotecnología. Eh, y por requisitos del guión voy a hacer mi presentación enteramente en inglés. So I'm going to switch to English as of now. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in uh, Spanish, Catalan, English. I can do French and something I call Italian. So this is me. Hi. I'm the director of Capital Cell. I'm a biologist who, for some reason, started a financial company back in 2015. For some reason means for... Uh, because of the ignorance of how hard it was. I am now the director of Capital Cell, which is a platform regulated by the Spanish financial authorities, and I'm also a partner at Nara Capital, which is a venture capital fund also regulated by the Spanish uh, stock market authorities. So what I want to talk to you about is the concept of investing ahead of the curve. The biotech revolution, which is happening, well, it has been happening for a while. Um, let me give you, let me not talk about Capital Cell. I do that a lot. So if you want to check about, about Capital Cell, you can go to our website. It's a great platform. We have become a really important actor in investing in biotech in Spain. But that's basically publicity. So let me skip. And let's go to what uh, should interest you, the biotech revolution. What's happening in biotechnology and why is it relevant? Well. What's happening is that our society is changing, and our society is changing in many, many ways. Some of them are terrible, and some of them are very interesting. And one thing that is definitely changing is medicine. So for a while, uh, as you know, or you might be aware, your life expectancy is now 40 years longer than that of your, well, that's 60 years ago, which is amazing. Life expectancy is growing a lot, and people who are born today stand a very, very high chance of living past the age of 100. My son, who's eight, claims that he's never going to die. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know if that's true, but it's very true that probably in our lifetime, we're going to have a shot at being, you know, living a long, long, long time. Let's see how much. At the same time, our society is uh, changing. The spread of diseases that affect us is changing. And Our societies no longer die massively of infectious diseases, but we are uh, seeing a higher, higher burden of chronic diseases, diabetes, um, Alzheimer, obesity, and soon cancer, which in the next few years, cancer is going to go the way that diabetes went from being a deadly illness to being a chronic disease. So, We're seeing more and more of that. And we don't just have more chronic diseases because the population is growing. Those are growing more than the population. At the same time, how long have you been hearing that the universal health, particularly in Europe where we have universal health care, is about to collapse? Yes, please. The, uh, the health system hasn't quite collapsed yet, but it's at a constant risk of uh, blowing up one of these days. And at the same time, new technologies have been appearing. And this is extremely relevant because new technologies have not been appearing in medicine um, as often as people think. And this is what I said but in numbers. What you see in yellow is the average retirement age. And what you see in blue is life expectancy. This is the United States, I think, but, well, same thing happens everywhere. So the trick is that people used to work until they died. Now, 
An average American has a 50% chance of living 30 years or more past his retirement age. So this whole thing is not just a health problem, it's an economic problem. It's mainly an economic problem, actually. So what's happening? We are changing the way we heal people. There's a paradigm shift. This is medicine today, and it has been for like uh, 100 years. Basically, the pharma industry, those of you who think of pharma and think of super highly advanced biotechnology, well, that's a new thing. It used to be chemistry, standard chemistry. If you drive on a highway past the factory of Merck, Sanofi, Pfizer, anything, you would think it's a sugar factory. It, it looks you know, like a petrochemical thing. And that's what it's been for years, chemistry. Pharma treatments are generalized. If you walk into a doctor's office today, you stand a very high chance of you know, coming out with a receipt for paracetamol or for a generic drug. Everything uh, is the same for almost every patient. And medicine is based on that, curing the sick. That's what we want to do. We want to take sick people and help them not dying. And the targets and what we've been measuring always is life expectancy. How long, how many years do we live? Um, and what's the rate of mortality? We look at how many children survive past the age of one. We look at how many you know, people survive past the age of retirement. Survival and longevity. And the R&D has been centered essentially around pharma industry. Who is innovating in drugs and therapies? The pharma industry, always. Typically, and what's happened? The rate of innovation has been very slow. Because have you ever met a pharma company that doesn't make tons of money? You haven't. And what's the bonus for them in innovation? Not a lot. So that is now broken. That paradigm is broken. And there's a new one. Now, healthcare needs to be sustainable. It's essential, it needs to be sustainable or it's going to stop working. Medicine has become personalized. Uh, if you take new therapies, you may have heard of immunotherapy, for example, it's uh, practically a miracle cure for cancer and it costs between 100 and 300 thousand dollars per year. And it is effective in about 30% of people. So medicine needs to become personalized. We are now capable of curing people we are now capable, or we want medicine to become preventive. We no longer want to cure the sick. We want to prevent people from getting sick. Sick people are expensive. They're, they need to be treated, they need to be supported, and they don't work. So we want to improve the quality of life, and we want to extend the working life. Just yesterday I was reading again about the, the patronal, the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce saying that we have to push retirement age uh, up to 72, I think, which doesn't sound right, but if you're healthy up to 80, well, maybe you will be bored if you don't work. We'll see. But anyway, that's the objective. Improve the quality of life. Not just push forward the number of years you live, but increase the quality of those years. And the innovation has shifted from R&D in farmers to something that is super familiar with the IT community here. Farmers are buying startups. Instead of developing innovation, they're buying it. And farmers have discovered that they now have a fire burning under their butts. So they must adapt. What's happening? I'll give you this example. Between 2001 and 2016, and that kept growing, the amount of money that's made from new therapies that didn't come from pharma has doubled. It means that the business is growing, but more and more of that business is not going into the farmer's pockets. Uh, this is a little more uh, clear. What you see here in green is the amount of new drugs in the market, approved by the FDA, this is the US, that come from small farmers, from small biotech companies, Granted, smaller for uh, these people means uh, sales under 100 million, but it definitely means not pharma. Those are basically evolved startups. 60% of new drugs are now coming from outside the pharma industry. And the pharma industry is finding this. 
the R&D returns have dropped to zero. That, which was posted by the CEO of Novartis uh, recently on LinkedIn, means that if you're a pharma and you spend one euro on R&D, you get back one euro. So, not great. <clears throat> and this is even more, um, I think, clear. In 2018, an analysis on the former data says that bank per buck, so the effectiveness of every dollar invested in a startup in biotech yields 6.4 times more product in the market than the R&D from pharma. This, well, probably a number of factors. We all know that startups are companies where super talented people work 17 hours a day and don't ask for a salary, whereas you know, the R&D in pharma is probably uh, more corporate and less efficient. But whatever it is, the difference is radical. So what's happening? It's simple. Farmers are now buying startups, exactly like any other industry. And not only are they buying it, they're buying it at stages that are uh, earlier every day. They used to, if you're familiar with clinical trials, phase two clinical trials is when you're trying a new drug on actual patients. And preclinical is when you're trying them on mice or other animals. So normally farmers would buy drugs that are past phase two, that have proven to be efficient. They're not doing that anymore. Well, they're also doing it, but they're now taking the risk of buying new products that have not proved to be effective in humans. They have to take the risk because by the time a good technology gets to phase two, someone else will buy it. So earlier and earlier, what's the key behind this? The key is technology, as usual. And there's a number of new technologies that are really interesting. There's a new generation of drugs. Some of these are chemical, and some of these are biological. And I've already seen three or four decks for a vaccine against aging. Um, that's probably going to come at some point. Genomics, and I'm going to go on a bit more about this, is really the key. Before genomics, we were fixing humans like we were fixing cars without opening the hood. We didn't know how the body worked. Genomics tells us how the body works and how the body will react to other things. So that's really important. The microbiome, the uh, four trillion bacteria that live inside our body are now being understood more and more. And it looks a bit weird, but you get now probiotics that can change the flora in your gut that prevent Alzheimer, for example. You get synthetic biology, which is probably the most amazing thing. It's not until, synthetic biology means creating cells or creating living organisms. And it was until I started thinking about that, as you know, life, has never been created unless, well, if you ask the Jehovah's Witnesses outside at the door, they probably will tell you this, but science has never seen life created. It is inherited, always. It is now being created, which means that we're going to be able to give people new cells manufactured to cure them, for example. There's artificial intelligence, there's connected health, there's a lot of things. Um, let me give you one example. So why is technology important? Technology is important because it enables people with less resources to achieve innovation, basically. And let me tell you about a driving force behind the biotech revolution. This is the price of sequencing one genome, the genome of one person. Those of you who are old enough might remember the uh, project Human Genome, or seem to remember that you could plug your computer into a net to help decipher one genome. That was back in 2001. It took years and it cost $100 million per genome. Uh, and as you're probably aware these days, you can put a bit of saliva in an envelope and get your whole DNA sequence for $300. Actually, you know probably what's the cheapest on the market, Guillermo. Around $100. $100. So when, uh, when I put this slide, it was 1000 So. Technology is not 100,000 times cheaper. It is now a million times cheaper in 20 years. And why is this important? Well, as a lot of you know, there's been a revolution in IT. This is why we're here. And this is why we all carry supercomputers in our pockets that are very, very cheap. Why is that happening? Because 
in 30 years, the cost of memory, of magnetic memory, did the same. It dropped in size, in price, and in availability. That enabled developers to create programs, etc. There's a whole world of things that can happen when computers do no longer take up a whole room. This, if I do a simple math thing with the cost of genomes, the biotech revolution is about here, roughly. So it's not at the start. It's not here yet. It's at the right time. That's why you should invest. So that is a technology 100,000 times cheaper. It really, really, really changes things, right? OK, so that's all very nice, and it's very promising. Um, but what about the money? Well, the money is following, obviously. The total VC, venture capital investment in health tech in 2021 was 86.3 billion. There's now more VC money being poured into health tech than ever. And it depends on how you define sectors. It is the third, second, or first sector of investment for VCs in the world. Nowhere near real estate, obviously, but we'll get there. Um, the most reasonable figures we found says that 25% of venture capital money being invested worldwide is going into health tech. It means that while normally the headlines are for the uh, super millionaire exit in IT, the sale of Twitter, the sale of Idealista, whatever, the sale of biotech startups is yielding so much more money. In average, 60% higher than uh, for the digital companies. The stock market for biotech just boomed in seven years. And strangely, biotech is, uh, has this reputation for being super slow, for being an investment where you put in the money and you see the returns in 12 years. Actually, it has become extremely fast. So the average exit time between business angels or small funds funding a Series A to exit has dropped to four years, which is, in average, again, shorter than in digital. And that's for the development of new drugs for an average sale value of $570 million, which is pretty decent. I already said that. But obviously, let me tell you that people are not just investing. They're making a killing. People who are investing in, in health tech, the few people who know what's going on and have the expertise to invest are making a lot of money. So let me finish by telling you that you should, if you don't understand or believe uh, any of the biotech revolution, you probably should just take a leap of faith. And I like to uh, give this example. You probably know who this guy is. That's Steve Jobs. Some of you might know who this guy is. His name is Armas Markula, and he was the first investor in, uh, in Apple. He was Finnish. So the very same year when this guy, Ken Olsen, was the chairman of the, I think, the third largest computer manufacturer in the world, and this guy said, uh, and he has admitted to saying it, there is no reason for any American to have a computer in his house. Well, while this guy was saying that, and a lot of his shareholders were agreeing, this guy invested $90,000 in Apple and made $183 million in three years. And, well, I would say this guy was right. That's why he has a big smile, and this guy is bold. Um, there's a lot of people who have been predicted, predicting that biotechnology is really going to change the way our lives are shaped. The famous mathematician Freeman Dyson, whom I've obscured the picture because he's a bit uncomfortable to look at, but he predicts that the domestication of biotechnology is going to dominate our lives in the next 50 years, the same way technology has dominated our lives in the past 50, dominated, enslaved. And Steve Jobs himself, um, before passing away, was saying very much the same things. The biggest innovations in the 21st century are going to come from the intersection of biology and technology. Thanks a lot. I'm now going to welcome to the stage uh, 
three companies we have with us today, LoopDig, Diagnostics, Prospera Biotech, and IDP Pharma. Well, actually, we have with us Loop and Prospera, and IDP Pharma is somewhere uh, on the way. And I'm not entirely sure who's going to go first. Prospera Biotech. Marta, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks a lot for traveling here. The floor is yours. Thank you. I think I'm going to do it this way better <laughs> with this hand. So, hello everybody. I'm Marta Garcia. I'm the CEO of Prospera Biotech. I, I guess you can hear me well. Is that okay? Okay. So, I'm sure that anyone in this room has a friend or a family member that had suffered cancer. So, you all know me know that one of the hardest things of cancer is precisely cancer treatment. And among, because of the side effects that it causes. Among these side effects, there's one that stands out and is the chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. Because CIPN is one of the most common side effects of chemotherapy, but most importantly, because this is the leading cause of treatment abandonment or dose decrease. CIPN consists of a sensation such as itch, pain, stingling, or even lack of sensitivity in hands and feet. Something as common as reading a book and pass the pages or button up a shirt could become impossible task for this patient. So you can imagine the, uh, the impact of CAPN in the daily life of the cancer patients. Unfortunately, or uh, chemotherapy drugs cause CAPN, including the traditional ones such as uh, platines or taxanes, but also the new immunotherapy treatments such as enfortumab. Uh, and the problem here is that there is no specific treatment for CIPN. For those cases that are more severe, such as, I mean, patients that can't even walk because of the pain they're feeling in their feet, uh, doctors can prescribe uh, strong drugs that attack on the uh, central nervous system, such as antidepressive or anticonvulsants, or even capsaicin patch, which are patch that have to be applied with local anesthetics because of the burning sensations that it causes. So there is a medical need to develop a solution for these patients, but there is also a social need to increase the quality of life of patients undergoing chemotherapy treatments. Prospera Biotech emerged from IDB at University Miguel Hernandez, and this institute has been working with the neurosensory system for more than 25 years. During this period, they have described, for instance, how uh, a receptor that's located in the, in the nerve endings, called TRPV1, which is here, increase its expressions and increase its activity after chemotherapy treatment. So TRPV1 plays a crucial role in the initiation of CAPN, and it also can be a target for improving the patient's quality of life in this in this uh, condition, CAPN. I should mention here that uh, the person who described first TRPV1 was the last year awarded with the Nobel Prize of Medicine, meaning that the academia recognized the clinical relevance of the neurosensory system in medicine. With this knowledge, the ADB developed a bunch of molecules that are TRPV1 antagonists. These molecules are able to reduce the activity of TRPV1, resulting in a decrease of each and pain. Prospera Biotech has an exclusive license for the use of one of these molecules in CIPN. And with that molecule called calmypsin, we have formulated a cream called Oncapsicens. Oncapsicens was tested in a pilot study last year, carried out in five Spanish hospitals, and we saw how it got an 80% of improvement, sorry, 80% of the patients who participated in our pilot study improve their sensory distress. But what is more important, they increase their quality of life because we were able to decrease the impact that this distress caused in their daily activity. Now, our next challenge is to carry out an international trial, which is already approved in more than 15 hospitals in Europe, so it's international now, in order to validate the use of oncapsicens as a preventive tool. Oncapsicens preventive will decrease the number of patients that develop CIPN, it will reduce the severity of the discomfort in those patients who eventually uh, have CAPN, but which is more important, it will let patients finish the treatment with chemotherapy 
improving their life expectancy. Um, I've mentioned before that there is no specific treatment for CAPN, but there are some companies that are trying to position their products in the skincare of oncologic patients. Compared to those companies, Prospera Biotech is the only one who's acting on the neurosensory system, which is the root of the discomfort. And Oncapsistence is the only product that has clinical evidence of its efficiency. And the good news for us is that those two features doesn't make our product more expensive than those offered by our competitors. I tell you nothing new if I say that cancer diagnosis is increasing year by year, and so does the CAPN market. In fact, it is estimated that by 2030, the market of CAPN reaches 1.5 billion of US dollars. Prospera Biotech aims to reach 3% of that market by the same year, 2030. Taking that into account and considering also our current sales, we've estimated our break-even for 2024 and a total sales of more than 30 million by 2027. Our next steps to get to that place will be uh, carry out, of course, the uh, international trial of Oncapsisons Preventive, regulated as a clinical or medical device in Europe and USA, and going to international markets starting on 2024 ahead. The team that's in charge of carrying this out is here. The board of directors is formed not only, but mainly by Professor Ferrer and Dr. Parente, who both has a large experience in scientific entrepreneurment. Management is now divided in an executive uh, branch, an executive area, which is led by me. The commercial team led by Susana Bejaro and the scientific and operation team led by Dr. Ferrandiz. And we are all supported by a strong uh, scientific uh, advisors, which are physicians of different areas such as oncology or, or dermatology. We've estimated that in order to take on capsicence to all the people who may need it, we need roughly a million of euros. We've already obtained 40% of that investment, so we're now opening a Series A of 600,000 euros. Uh, considering our forecast and current sales, we've set the price, the pre-money value of the company in 11 million. So we're offering a 5%, roughly a 5% of our shares. However, we are now offering a 30% of discount for those who uh, manifest their, their will of investing before the round goes public by the mid or end of this month. And we let, then let a 25% of discount during two weeks or permanent for those investors who invest more than 15,000 euros. We're going to open the round with capital sell. Ex the exit of the, of the company is planned in five years from now, either by going to the public, public market or being acquired or fusion with a larger company of the biotech area. Here I put, oh, sorry, that one, you cannot see that one. Here I put some examples of similar transactions in the last two years. So thank you very much, and I'm open to any question now that you may have. Any questions from the audience? <clears throat> no, people would be shy, no problem. So, thanks a lot, uh, Marta. Thanks for the presentation. And uh, I guess that the next presentation is going to be from Loop. Yes, Enrique. Again, thanks for making the journey here. And yours. Thank you. Um, so, I am Rick Hernandez, uh, CEO of Loop Diagnostics. Uh, so, in Loop Diagnostics, we have developed an early test uh, device that is able to detect sepsis in the early phase 10 times faster and 3 times more sensitive than the current solution. Do you know what is sepsis? Sepsis happens where uh, a located bacterial infection, for example, urinary tract, is moving to the blood and becoming systemic. This is a very important problem because the early identification is not clear. The symptoms can be same clear like a flu. However, we have a big problem in numbers because 50 million people worldwide is affected and big numbers in mortality. One of these uh, in five deaths globally are associated with sepsis. 
the main problem of sepsis is the early identification because we have in this early phase one to six hour where the symptoms are not so clear is where a uh, broad spectrum antibiotics are really effective with low mortality and low cost uh, for the hospital. However, more than 50% of the patients have been diagnosed after symptoms clear, but in this phase, the mortality is so high because antibiotics are not really effective and the cost for the hospital is, is also higher. Uh, right now, uh, one of the problems is that the current diagnostics are not able to detect sepsis in the early phase. This diagnostic has two strategies, or detect the pathogen detection that is only present in 30% of the sample of sepsis in emergency room, early sepsis, or detect other biomarkers like procalcitonin or uh, PCR that uh, are biomarkers related with damage of the body. So the detection window is late and the sensitivity also is less than 30%. What do uh, Loop? Loop have a novel, a novel strategy that are able to detect sepsis early because we are looking for the immune system status of the patient. Thanks to this functional assay, we stimulate the cells and measure the immune response of these cells. Thanks to this, our detection window starts from the first hour and we have 90% of sensitivity. This has been proven in a proof of concept thanks to our collaborator, Berbice Hospital. What is the basic, the science behind? So during sepsis, bacteria is affecting the immune system, inflammating the patient. However, after the first hour, the, the immune cells are transforming to immunosuppression status. So thanks to our loop, we are able to detect this immunosuppression from the patient that are reduced after the first hour and is maintaining like this during the first 72 hours compared with the rest of biomarkers that appear later and also with a closed window detection. Thanks to this, we create our product. This is SeptiLoop. This is a simple product device that uses lateral flow technology on the top with our inflammatory biomarkers to detect the immune response and a tube where we mix one milliliter of whole blood with one milliliter of our reactive. We are able, after two hours and a half of incubation, to detect the immune response of the patient. The known immune response of the patient are related with the sepsis status. So uh, these devices are, uh, are developed to, uh, to work in any la emergency laboratory. Just re require a thermo block that hit the sample during these two hours and a half. And then we have the result in positive or negative, like a COVID test with band. This is the result. So our proof of concept in hospital, in Belvice Hospital, that we include 170 patients and 100 control, we can show 90, almost 90% of sensitivity and 96% of negative predictive value compared with the competitor biomarker like PCT, the procalcitonin, that have 30% of sensitivity. Also, we are doing an extra clinical trial in Tauli Hospital with, uh, uh, for the regulatory purpose. Because right now our product is in an industrial phase and we are certifying uh, the product at the end of this year. So in case of the IP, the, we share the IP with, with Iribel, the, the foundation of Belviche Hospital. We have already the exclusive uh, license to loop. And in case of uh, regulatory, we have cleared the pathway. And actually, we are so close during this year to finish the regulatory in Europe with the C mark. In, our, in case of the business model, our first business model will use a medical district distributor to arrive to the hospital. The price will be around uh, 50 euros per test, uh, taking into account that our cost of the device of each test is around uh, uh, 10 euros. So uh, this is our first business model. However, we have more business model in mind, but imagine this test that can be working in the nursing home, telling to the nurse that uh, the patient is developing a sepsis and sending the patient to the hospital. The market is big because from one septic patient, there are nine more suspected septic patients that appear in the emergency room. In case of the competitor, we can classify the competitor depending on the technology. The bottom is the competitor that are, you are analyzing pathogen. As, as I tell you before, just 30% of the sample in the emergency setting have a pathogen 
o any molecular pathogen. So there are no effective to detect sepsis in the emergency settings. The next competitor, using biomarker of damage, also are not able to detect sepsis in the early phase. We have the most close competitor, immunospressor inflammatories, that have a PCR for sepsis uh, with several genes, also, take, uh, uh, also don't are able to be uh, competitive in the emergency setting. So we are the only one right now that with our device, we are able to detect sepsis in from emergency settings. So in case of the market, we will start in Europe with the after the CMR approval at the end of this year, and then escalate two countries more next year, and in 2025, start the FDA approval in order to start penetration in the in, uh, US. And finally, the company has more developer of the device with the idea of not just the TET, but uh, sepsis, yes or no, also the bacterial type, like uh, gram positive versus gram negative. So this is the team. The green part are the full-time team of the company. Then we have two part-time clinicians working for us and uh, help us in the clinical trial. And two more people uh, from the business side help us to the financials area, working also part-time for the company. Also, we have two advisors, very important, Jean-Pierre and Thomas. We, uh, advisor are how to penetrate the market and also uh, taking contact for distributor. And also, I can highlight Antonio Artigas uh, from part of Lee that we are doing a clinical study in order to appear in the sepsis alliance like a promising device for sepsis early diagnosis. So right now we are uh, we are in the C mark um, in 2023. So our main uh, goal is to approve to obtain the C mark certification. So because the device is close to industrialization and also we obtaining the we are working for obtaining the C mark. Then next year, start working in the sales and also in clinical trial cost effective to improve the sales and finally scale up more, uh, to, more than one, uh, Spain, to more than one country. So right now, we have received several funding, 2.5 uh, public funding, uh, that, uh, and we are looking for uh, interest for private investment to cover the C round of 70, 50, uh, thousand euros. So thank you very much. And, ah, sorry, last time, the exit strategy, very important. We can highlight this competitor. This competitor developed a quantiferon, the only device in the market similar to our strategy of the stimulated sales. And this competitor was acquired by Kia Ye for 30, uh, 55 million in 2011. So thank you very much. And if you uh, want more information, you can put the QR. Thanks a lot, Enrique. And uh, so we have a last presentation from the CEO of uh, IDP Pharma, Santiago Esteban. Is he with us? Thanks a lot for coming uh, today. You, yeah, you, yeah, you okay? Yeah. Half, half okay? Half okay. Good. So, uh, the machine. Okay. Okay. So I just touched my uncle, my uncle, a few days ago. So it's a bit uh, painful, but that's fine. So I guess if I move on, okay, I got myself here. Oh, here it is, here it is. So um, I think everybody is uh, well aware of cancer, right? That's our core expertise. That's what we put all our time during the last eight years. Unfortunately, I think cancer is one of these diseases that help us to know how old we are because it depends on how many people you know got cancer um, around you, and that is telling you how old you are, right? In my case, I have, um, fortunately, three people have around me of my age got cancer in the last year, one passed away, and one very close friend now is fighting with a kind of leukemia. So it's a serious threat for everybody. Also antimicrobials uh, regarding the previous presentation. Um, this month is the month of multiple myeloma. Um, maybe you are not aware of that disease. It's a cancer, it's a kind of adult cancer. And I think it's important that we have this awareness on all these kind of diseases. Multiple myeloma is incurable and is um, hitting us as soon as we get 50 or older. 
Anyway, my name is Santiago Esteban. I'm CEO and founder of IDP Pharma. What we do at IDP is kind of magic. We think we are somehow magicians in the industry because we have turned these other proteins, this is a particular class of proteins, into draggable. This means that for a long time, the pharma has tried to develop drugs for key disease drivers, and they failed in the last 20 years. We finally got a solution for that, and that is part of what I'm going to present to you. But before going into details, for those that are more curious, I'm going to give you some context on what IDPs are. So we have on the, on the left side of the screen, on my left side, we have a classical protein that is well folded, is visible. We know the structure. We can find pockets in that protein so we can develop drugs for these um, classical target. That's what the industry has done for many years. However, on the right side, we have what we call an invisible target. There is no fixed structure. This protein is going to interchange into millions of conformations. So the best we can get as a picture is in a spaghetti dish. And we don't know what to do with that, really. Can we design drugs to target this protein? How? How is it going to dock into a spaghetti? I mean, if it would be a macaroni, maybe we can block the holes, right? But there is no way. So what we have done at IDP, and previously, uh, during my career, I'm a scientist. I spent my life studying these proteins. That, by the way, these are 50% of our genome is composed of intrinsically disordered proteins, or IDPs. That's the name of the company. It's very original, right? I think. So I developed techniques during more than 15 years to learn how they behave. And at IDP, from an industry basis, we leap forward and manage to find very tiny regions of order within these proteins. And we manage to develop drugs for these tiny regions of order within the disorder. And that allows us to finally modulate this new class of proteins that are known to be key disease drivers in many diseases, including cancer, that is our core expertise. So this is, oh, looks a bit awful. Was not planned like that. Anyway, this is what we have built during the last eight years. So we started here in the, at the very first in 2015. We developed a technology Today we call Intramatics Platform. Thanks to this platform, we have built an exclusive portfolio of products, all of them first in class, targeting IDP proteins. And we have protected with seven patents, four of them already granted worldwide. What is already giving you the, the power behind the technology and how it's going to clear the path for commercialization in the future, particularly for the pharma that are our target for a buyout of the company. So thanks to our pipeline, we have also get recognition in the industry. We have licensed two assets and partnered with one pharma. The pharma we have partnered is quite important. It's a huge milestone for us. It's 2.5 billion revenues. And that pharma can bring a compound from idea up to the market. These licensing or agreement deals are outside cancer space. We have really keep our strong expertise inside the company that demonstrated to the industry that is translational what we are doing because of the importance of IDP proteins. And today, in 2023, we are a clinical stake company. We got approval of our first product to start clinical trials in Spain, and that is going to happen next April. So it's pretty handy time to join us and move forward. And this asset is called IDP one to one and I give you a brief about what this asset does, why it's so special. Well, the company is led by my colleague, Laura, that is the founder of the company, together with myself, but of course with the support of a lot of professionals. That cannot be done alone, as the same as with a lot of expertise from our scientific advisory board that is outstanding, as you're going to find out. We have raised 10 million euros in the past eight years. And that was necessary to build a technology first and then to expand upon our products. And now we are rising 2.2 million euros to finance the clinical trial of IDP one-to-one -one in cancer. So a bit of faces here so you get to know the team. There are many more people working for the company, right? But I want to highlight Laura. She is our CSO and is also board of directors. 
She's a technology inventor, and she is also an expert in drug design and drug development. Then two people, very important, uh, Tim Hammond and Kevin Lynch. This is a seasoned industry professional. Tim Hammond was responsible for all the portfolio of AstraZeneca UK for more than 15 years, from phase one up to registration. He was handling more than 200 people at that time. And Kevin Lynch, um, is a, Kevin Lynch is a seasoned oncologist. He was the VP for clinical in Asia for Celgene. Celgene is a company that dominated multiple myeloma market, just the disease of this month, and was acquired by Bristol for 70 billions in 2019. So he lost the job, of course, right? And then Kevin moved to Antigene. You start to see the connection. Cell gene, antigen, it sounds pretty similar, right? Bristol is the biggest investor of antigen. Kevin was the board of directors of antigen and was the CMO of antigen. It's a company that was running now like 15 clinical trials. So Kevin is with us, right? That's very important. And then we got Ella. Ella is an experienced BD person that have, uh, has, she has helped us to find agreements with the pharma in Europe and in the States with our deals, by the way, in ophthalmology, in respiratory diseases, and skin disorders. And she has been very fundamental for that, to leverage that potential of our platform. And of course, we got uh, an outstanding advisory board. We are very proud of that. We are a very silenced company, almost a steel company. You are gonna, you're not, not going to find us out there in the, in, in the news. But you probably noticed we got Sir Peter Clarkfleet on board. She's a Nobel laureate, 2019. And I still remember when I called him, hey, Peter, you know what, congratulations. Just one year after, he got the Nobel Prize. But you know, we have the first track that is degrading your favorite target. Yet he say, OK, show me the data. Here's the data. And he say, I jump on board. And that was as easy as it sounds. He was really impressed about what we are doing. Then, of course, we got other people involved, like Dean Fester from Stanford. Dean is the person that describes oncogene addictions in cells. Dean is the person that describes how cancer cells escape immune systems. So you can imagine how profound is the know-how that Dean is bringing to the company. And, of course, the rest of the people, Tommy and David, industry experts with several marketed drugs. David brought the first RAF inhibitor. That was a breakthrough in the field into the clinics in approval. And Tommy got three already marketed drugs on his shoulders. Then Andrew Spencer. Andrew is a world leader in multiple myeloma. Now, I think I cannot hide anymore what IDP one to one does. And Andrew is running the second largest multiple myeloma in the world. And Jane Johnson. Jane Johnson is an expert in neuroendocrine cancer. She is the person that discovered and put the name to one of our targets. So once again, everybody is here because there is a reason. And we work with, with them because there is a reason. So IDP one to one. This is the first ever molecule that blocks the underlying disease cause of multiple myeloma. This has never, ever happened. And we are really keen on bringing this molecule into clinical trials. Some hospitals that are going to help to do that are Baidebron, Hospital Universitari, 12 de Octubre, and Valdecillas. And want to give you some context on multiple myeloma and IDP one to one. IDP, multiple myeloma is an incurable disease, even though there are a lot of therapies out there, but none of them has faced the underlying cause of the disease, the underlying target, you know what? Because it's an IDP, and nobody got a technology to target IDPs. Lots of new cases every year, and the incident is growing because we are aging, because we live more. That's the only reason. And you know what? Because our target is so fundamental for the disease, before you get multiple myeloma, you get a gammopathy. And the day they tell you, now you are sick, now you got multiple myeloma, there is only one reason. Our protein appears in your cells. So it's so fundamental that now we have the opportunity to block the appearance of the disease before you become sick. 
That's what we are dreaming. We dream in the past to inhibit IDPs, and we did it. And now we dream to treat first patients with no options, because that's the standard regulatory path, but then to bring down the technology up to we block the appearance of the disease. Multiple myeloma is a huge market. It's insanely huge. Today, it's 23 billion. And by the way, this is a rare disease. That's why it's so attractive. And the dominators are Sergin in 2019 and Bristol Myers today because they bought Sergin. This is the, just to send you the tendency on the dynamic. These are early licensing deals, deals that took place after phase one. This is exactly the phase we are going to transition now, starting next April. And you will find deals in the market from 200 to 900 million euros because the market is so huge, so attractive, and there is no definite solution, of course, for that disease. And this is our plan. In the next two years, we're going to develop IDP one-to-one -one through uh, multiple myeloma, phase one, and become ready for licensing the company, the asset, sorry. We're going to develop another asset with public funding. We have raised 4 million euros of public funding, so we are pretty sure we can do that. And in two years' time, we start another phase one with another disrupted target. And our parties, our um, third parties that are working on ophthalmology, respiratory, and skin disorder with our licensings are developing these. This, they risk the company, decreases the amount of funding we need, and we are expecting milestones from 2025 on, thanks to that. Uh, agreements. We've been granted 1.2 million euros from the government to finance the clinical trial, and now we are looking for one more million to complete the studies. And this crowdfunding campaign through Capital Cell is coming, so stay tuned. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, Santiago. That's very interesting. And we're finishing on time, which is more important. Uh, Thanks a lot to everyone. Thanks a lot to Day One, who once again made this our home here four years from now. And I hope that you have enjoyed uh, the talk. I hope that you have enjoyed seeing these three guys, Enrique, Marta, and Santiago, three ordinary people with a really, really low amount of resources who are developing technologies that are worth billions to the pharma industry. That was our point entirely today. So I hope you enjoyed it and enjoy the rest of four years from now. Thanks a lot, everyone.